Hello everybody and welcome to a first update on the revival of Getting Things Gnome. If you're watching this, you're probably among those who have read my blog post or have filled a survey I published about the best ways we can put the GTG project back on track. If you don't know what GTG is or what GTD is, you may be interested in checking out the previous video I did about the Getting Things Done methodology and the blog post I wrote about the Getting Things Gnome application. So, I'm sure many of you have been wondering what has been going on behind the scenes and what I have been up to since the survey. Why did I not blog about it until now? Mostly, I've just been kind of busy with other things. One of the things that kept me busy was producing a video presenting the GStreamer community, the GStreamer conference, and what makes it successful. Life got in the way, things to deal with at home, trying to solve a bunch of things to make myself more efficient, and that takes time. And at the same time, well, I have been triaging bugs and establishing a plan for putting the Getting Things Gnome project back on track. Luckily, at least one person showed up, Diego, to start working on merging pull requests and fixing various bugs in the current development version. So things are not resting entirely on me, which is a good thing, because you never know if I might be captured by a mob of outraged French people for saying chocolatine instead of pain au chocolat. So thank you, Diego, for your spontaneous involvement. It really is encouraging and heartwarming. And I hope that many more will follow your example. And many passionate, talented people like you will join the project this year. So with that said, today I will share the results of the survey I did back in October, as well as my personal analysis so that you understand the situation we're in and the logic that guides how I intend to put this project back on its feet. Over 1,200 people looked at the survey, but only 214 people completed the questionnaire. So I'm only using that part of the data set because otherwise it would completely mess up the validity of the data and make it nearly impossible to analyze. One of the questions was, what desktop environment or platform do you use? Especially free ones. And the vast majority of people in the survey run GNOME 3 or one of its derivatives. Statistically speaking, the sampling may be biased, of course, because the survey is a voluntary one and not a mandatory survey of the whole population. So take this figure with a grain of salt. But even if we had a big margin of error, well, the picture is pretty clear. Now, from a broader perspective, 63% of the respondents are familiar with the Getting Things Done methodology. 58% of respondents said they need an advanced personal task manager to survive in today's fast-paced work environment. In terms of familiarity, about a third of the respondents have used Getting Things Gnome before, and the majority of those people want to be reassured that the project is doing okay and want to ensure that it remains maintained in the future. Interestingly, nearly 60% of respondents have never used GTG before and would be interested in using it, which is encouraging potential new users. And then a remaining 6% said they have never used it and don't intend to use it, but they just love taking surveys. <laughs> well, I'm glad you had fun. Thanks for participating, guys. Now on the question of frequency, 58% of the people said they use a desktop or laptop computer every day to organize their tasks lists. 25% said they use that a couple times per week. 7% said once per week, 3% said once per month, and 2% said they only use a mobile phone tablet, to which you need to add 4% of people didn't even answer the question. So. This question is actually quite interesting because it tells me that the traditional computer remains an essential productivity tool. Almost nobody said they rely only on their mobile devices and over 80% of the people surveyed use their computer to manage their task lists multiple times per week, if not daily. So yes, while there are always, there will always be those who say you should do everything at once and it's unacceptable to have 
a desktop centric application in this day and age, you can't possibly be relevant if you're anything other than a mobile application. Well, the data is in this sample does not actually support that claim. It tells me that it still is worth your time to contribute to this desktop application project because that's where the majority of the work happens, which comes at as no big surprise to anybody who uses task lists extensively to manage their whole life, especially professionally. So sure, in theory, it's nice to have both a desktop and mobile application, but the desktop app has to come first and we have to make it good. If someone wants to work on a mobile ports and synchronization, nobody's gonna stop you. We're, we'll be happy to see it happen. And to an extent, it will be interesting to see if we will even have to do specialized work on this front, considering that the GTK user interface toolkit that we use allows making adaptive user interfaces, that is, interfaces that will automatically adapt to fit a mobile device screen or to leverage the available space on a computer monitor. In theory, if someone wants to run it on a Pine phone or a Librem phone, it should be quite possible. Now, on the question of contributing, 42% of people would not be willing to contribute code on a regular basis, and 36% did not answer the question, possibly bringing the figure up to 77% if you include those who say they might con only contribute occasionally. On the upside, the remaining 23% of people said they would be interested in contributing regularly, which is great. And that means nearly 50 people. Imagine if most of these are willing to contribute regularly and are able to do so, we would be done in no time at all. Now, I understand some people may encounter obstacles or have changes in their personal life that makes that change this uh, statistic. But still, it is highly encouraging. And I think that we together can achieve something great here. So I need to focus on being able to bring you people into the project by lowering the technical barriers to entry and making it easy to know what to work on. So please stay tuned. I asked, are there any things preventing you from contributing code to the project currently? What are they? What would make this easier for you? 32% of the respondents answered and gave me some details here. Thank you for that. I left the answer field as a freeform text field so that it could be totally open-ended and people could tell me you know, what's on their mind instead of what I think is the problem. It turns out though that the answers fell into predictable patterns, which I have summarized into five general categories for the sake of simplicity. First. 40% of the people say they don't have time. Fair enough. 5% said they don't know how to code at all, which I suspect is actually a very underestimated number. Probably the majority of people who are not programmers don't even answer the question or did not know there was this survey going on. 30% said the problem is that they are not familiar with the Python programming language or the GTK user interface toolkit including two people out of 19 who prefer toolkits other than GTK. 15% of the people said they need a better onboarding process or developer story to get started with contributing. And 10% were saying that spending time on a desktop version is a waste of their time in their opinion. So let me comment on a couple of general patterns here about the lack of time. I totally understand that. Unfortunately, I can't create time for you in your life. I can only work on making the de developer story better by having a clearly outlined roadmap and well triaged list of issues to work on, as well as a well documented set of tools to build, test, modify the application, and hope some of you eventually decide to, to contribute, even if it's one Saturday afternoon once in a while to fix one tiny bug that affects you. For those few saying that this can't be relevant unless we do a mobile version and a million other things, again, you have to understand here, I'm trying to save this project from cardiac arrest. I'm not trying to make it run the marathon yet. We have to get a release out of the door first. 
And we have to do that with the most fundamental product, which is the desktop application. For those who wish this application was written in a different programming language or use a different toolkit, well, the worst thing that can happen to any open source project is to fall into the trap of rewriting the code base from scratch because of language wars. I've seen it happen over and over and over again, and it rarely works. I would highly recommend you check out the article written by Joel Spolsky called Things You Should Never Do, which I will link to in the description down below. Now, besides, if people would let's say, rewrite it in Qt and C++. Not only would it take years and introduce a ton of new issues because it's new code, you would get as many if not more people complaining that it's Qt and C++. And honestly, life is too short for that. Now, the question is, would people be willing to donate money instead of code? So here are some simplified numbers. 60% of people said they would not be willing to give any money at all. 15% of the people said they would contribute less than $5 a month. 22% said they would contribute up around $5 a month. 5% said $10 a month. And pretty much nobody wants to give more than that. There was one person who said, oh, $20 per month, but that's it. With this survey sample size, that boils down to barely $300 to $400 per month which is not enough to pay people to work full-time on the boring parts. Even when you consider platforms other than Linux, when you ask if a Windows or Mac OS version would be a requirement for people to be willing to donate money, only about 30 people, or roughly 15%, said that this would be a requirement. Now, in terms of features, the top-ranked priorities are essentially just get a release out of the door ASAP. Closely followed by usability improvements and then the notion of project. Ranking second is, again, usability improvements and the notion of projects. They still rank highly here, while everything else stays secondary. Interestingly enough, performance improvements are not a chief concern for the people in the survey. It only becomes a concern and the third and fourth ranks. So, what do we do with this? What is the path forward? Well, it's quite clear I can't pay people to work on it, so the path forward is to make the project easier to contribute for, for everybody. So we need to make sure to get a release out of the door as soon as possible. And I need you to get involved with testing and providing patches to help with this. We're this close to the finish line. So here's what I'm doing to make it easier to contribute and get that release out of the door. For starters, I have tree out all the bugs and I redefined the roadmap using two milestones, the upcoming 0.4 release and the 0.5 release. I'll leave the link below so you can easily check them out because the milestones act as the dynamic roadmap. Issues that are critical for a particular release are targeted to those milestones, which tells you what is the minimum required set of bug fixes needed for us to get the release out of the door. And that lets you get involved with these issues directly. Now, here's why this is important. With these milestones and the triaging, I'm implementing what boils down to be a much more structured policy when it comes to how to make this project sustainable. Number one, if it's not strictly required for the release or to make it easier to work on a release, and it's not a critical bug, then it's not targeted to that release. It does not go on the roadmap. That means you don't have to fix everything now. Small bugs can ha that have workaround can wait. Unless, of course, you have the time and energy to fix them. Go ahead. Second principle. Feature requests can always wait. And in particular, if it's a feature that regular contributors don't personally need for themselves, it's probably going to be tagged with patch or won't happen. That's the initial label. And it clearly indicates that we like the idea, but if nobody steps up to do it, 
not gonna happen. Third principle is issues that are too easy to fix will be tagged with the low hanging fruit label so that new contributors can find those issues, get started with them, use them to learn the code base and how the project contribution workflow works. Fourth principle is old issues that we are not encountering ourselves and that have not been tested with the development version will be considered obsolete until proven otherwise. Overall, the idea is to have less stuff in your face and to be able to move forward with a clear sense of clarity and priorities set accordingly. We need to feel like we are making progress towards a goal and we need to be able to know when a release is done. It also makes the project much less intimidating for newcomers because you don't have to crawl through hundreds of tickets to find the needle in the haystack. Also, note that means we're not going to look at any issues that are in downstream Linux distribution bug trackers. This is not our turf, we don't have the time, and it is a well-known fact that distro bug trackers are where the bug reports go to die. I speak from experience of contributing to many other open source projects. If you want your bug to be investigated and fixed, test with the Git version, maybe with the flat pack package that we're planning to provide and report it on the upstream GTG bug tracker, not your distro's bug tracker, unless it's a packaging issue. This approach might sound pretty radical to some people, particularly those who haven't been doing open source project management for over a decade, but trust me, it's the only way to drain this swamp and to re-energize this project. Indecision is poison. Trying to do everything at once is paralysis. Perfect is the enemy of the good, and the goal here is to get things done. So, whenever I have some spare time, I'm going to try to harmonize the, document, the documentation for contributors. I'll also leave a link below to the ticket that lists all the documentation things to fix. Feel free to suggest specific improvements, or even better, to volunteer to work on these with me if you'd like to contribute on the testing and documentation front. Well, that's it for today. Uh, thanks for your interest and I hope to see you soon as part of the GTG community. And if not, well, I hope you found this video interesting, in which case, feel free to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel or my blog mailing system to be notified about further updates. Thanks for watching. See you next time.